Dr. Goodman once again for starting this off. I think you know putting you at the beginning is perfect because the next two people that we're going to be having speak to us are some of the researchers who've actually been um, putting out or gathering information and looking at some of the conditions um, and scuba therapy, people with disabilities, cognitive, physical, and um, this next person uh, who's representing his wife. She um, has been doing research with pe people with PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Uh, she's been working for the past, better part of two years. Three. Three, <laughs> three years um, on her doctoral, this is her doctoral research study. And we're really excited, they're really excited with the outcomes and they hope to be a published uh, result, a uh, published research uh, by this time next year. So Bill is here, thankfully, so that he can share the research that his wife Jane has done. So just so you know, we got remarried in the church this last Saturday, 35 years in the, in the Sacramento Cathedral. We thought we were doing pretty good until they announced this Philippine couple who have been married 71 years, all right? They were 93 each, uh, had been married in, uh, during the World War II as guerrillas. I, I apologize because uh, you're getting the worst half of the marriage. This is my wife, Jane, Dr. Floyd. Yes. Okay. All right. So, all right. Well, well. Sorry. I am Jane's research assistant. All right, <laughs> and I can appreciate what Dr. Goodman went through. She has a library of over 300 articles or 700 articles of uh, of interest, and you comb through those, and it's been a lot of work. Her topic is an assessment of scuba diving. It's an adaptive sport program for those veterans that suffer TBI or PTSD. A little bit of background. Nearly a half a million veterans came back from the war <coughs> with TBI or PTSD. Two and a half million were recruited. Half a million came back with some form of injury. The estimated annual cost to deal with this is about $11,000 a veteran. Doesn't sound like a lot until you start multiplying that times half a million. It's a big deal. PTSD, they estimate that the cost is to deal with them is about 16 grand per case. So all of a sudden you're starting to get into something fairly large. It's interesting to look at the Congressional Budget Office. The cost of care has gone up considerably and they think that it'll get to 54 billion dollars. So the cost of the war continues to go on. Continues to go on. And yet, nobody really knows the long-term impact of what these veterans suffered from TBI and PTSD. President Obama's speech, he said, we need to take care of these veterans. It means doing even more to help them. And we have to end the tragedy of suicide among our veterans. 22 a day. All right, it's significant. It's very interesting, the, the VA environment, the budget continues to go up. 2001, 2009, increased to 3.9 billion. 2013, it got up to 6.2 billion. And yet they're still not adequately addressing the issues or the problems. A lot of the vets opt not to seek service. There's a lot of reasons for that. Partly because they're not lo local to any VA. A lot of them are remote. So they choose a lot of unhealthy coping styles or permanent methods to deal with their injuries. One of the interesting things about this particular series of wars wasn't so much a regular army. A lot of reservists, a lot of National Guards, a lot of civilians that got recruited into this created a different population. A lot more women. A lot of these people were not connect, connected to the military community in the classical sense. Dr. Floyd looked at the comorbidity, I can't even say the words, comorbidity of TBIs and PTSDs. And it turns out they roughly have the same kind of uh, signals and the same kind of symptoms. <coughs> Probably can't read that, but basically it talks about 
TBI, headaches, dizziness, nausea, sensitivity to light, vision changes. PTSD is on high alert. Startled easily, fearfulness, flashback, nightmares. It goes on. You probably know people in your own experience that suffer PTSD. Or you've probably seen something in a shopping mall where uh, something falls over and a veteran literally climbs under the table. I've seen that. It's, it's frightening to see somebody with PTSD. PTSD, there was no, fr you know, the problem with this last war, there was no front lines, all right? No matter where you went, you were in constant danger, you're under high alert. So you just, it was just a, a year of constant emotional being on high alert. 36,000 of the veterans were so uh, wrapped up in PTSD they didn't even get deployed. Another 128,000 got deployed and combined with the TBI, we're talking about a half a million out of two and a half million veterans were affected with TBI and PTSD. It's interesting. Severe TBIs were treated immediately. Pretty obvious, head wound, you know, whatever, got treated immediately. But mild and moderate TBIs, or concussions as we would call them, how do you know if you're in the middle of a battle and you kind of get knocked around a little bit and you get up and what you got to do? You have to go because your buddies are there. So we really don't know how many people suffered mild or moderate TBIs. So this data is for those that reported it, but it could be larger than that. And we think that U.S. troops are at a higher risk to sustain more than one mild traumatic brain injury, especially in the type of war that we've been in. If you <clears throat> look at it, TBI was called the signature injury of these last wars because they all wear body armor now, they all wear, you know, they sit inside uh, pretty well protected vehicles. So IEDs are their main in enemy. So uh, Dr. Floyd went to a couple of uh, military seminars and they showed from the inside of a, of a tank driving down the road and they're driving down the road and all of a sudden an IED blow up. And she said, you could just feel the room shake. You know, those of you who've been in the service know exactly what we're talking about. As I said, the longer term issues of the war are just beginning to be felt. $54 billion is a price that we're all going to pay for these vets. We've already seen it with the Vietnam veterans. As a matter of fact, a couple of the divers that uh, came and participated in this were Vietnam vets, okay? But when you start to add PTSD, TBI, and a lot of the divers that were in this study that we could not count suffered spinal cord injuries, all right? And we'll talk about that. But basically, the results are the same for them, all right? By the way, they're positive. There's a big stigma inside the veteran population to seek help, especially psychology. You know what they call psychologists? Wizards, okay? You go see a psychologist and poof, you never come back to the unit. So they were reluctant to seek psychological help. Much higher population of women in the last 10, 15 years in the military. And that presents a pretty unique set of circumstances when you think about it. Mothers, okay, wives, okay, a different kind of camaraderie needs to be developed. 25% of the VA have psychiatric disorders. Half have more than one. Pretty significant, pretty significant. And yet half the soldiers in Iran and Iraq expressed concern about seeking treatment. So here we have a half a million identified. We don't really know how many suffer concussions or TBIs. Only one in three have sought treatment for PTSD, even though they've been identified. Veterans that return with a disability have a lower quality of life, all right? It's been studied, it's been proven. And along the line, we find that, just like Dr. Goodman found, that people that remain physically active 
seem to have a higher level of satisfaction in life. Report fewer, fewer days of pain, experience a higher life expectancy. Recreational sports provides that positive impact, things like equine therapy, alpine skiing, fly fishing. But again, a lot of what we could find in the literature was anecdotal, or a study of five, or a study of 12, okay? But it gets you the hint that if we go and just get bigger studies, what could we do? So higher quality of life is a potential outcome of therapeutic recreation. Prior studies, we talked about there's a study at the Bolingbrook, uh, Illinois, had a small VFW study. We talked about the Cayman Island study, which was the under study. And there's been several uh, HBOT, Hyperic Oxygen Therapy studies, all right? But they're all inconclusive. <coughs> None of them had any statistics with them. They had some data, but no statistical samples. As, as Dr. Goodman said, you need to have control groups, you need to be able to verify it, okay, etc. But there is a growing interest in this country to say how do we treat TBI and PTSD. That's what this research was all about. Veterans that had comorbid diagnosis of TBI and PTSD and how they were affected by scuba diving. A lot of I know I've recognized some of you because I've been here before. You've observed and heard the positive things. You can hear people coming out of the water. It's great, I love it, you know? But you don't know what the researchers say. Well, that's just anecdotal, right? It's just stories, okay? It's your opinion, all right? Based on what? So statistical data was needed to prove this. Research study took three years, all right? And I can tell you, I understand why it took three years. It takes a long time to, first of all, sort out what you're trying to accomplish. Second of all, to find divers. It's a little harder to find divers in Illinois than it is in California, we learned, all right? Uh, but the whole premise of this is engaging in scuba diving develops a higher quality of life for those who have served in the military. Now, anecdotally, that's the same truth in civilian population, but we <coughs> wanted to work on our controlled population. Now, doctor, you know this, in order to graduate, you gotta write a thesis, right? <laughs> so this is, this is Dr. Floyd's thesis, all right? One of the things that she found was that scuba diving I'll just tell you this anecdotally. We had several, several divers that were like sergeants, E5s or whatever, that would talk about the squad experience and about the same camaraderie that exists inside a squad, that exists inside a dive. They would, they would talk about, he's got my back. I'd be afraid to go in the water and I realized he had my back. <coughs> That's powerful. Okay, that's powerful. So can we really change their assessment, self-reported assessment of their quality of life, all right? So she used an internationally recognized questionnaire, a test, designed specifically to measure quality of life. And she analyzed pre and post dive of discover dives, first time in the water, okay? and longitudinal dives where they went on and got certified in the ocean, okay? And statistically valid sample sizes were gathered for, for each. And this is when I said I understand why the UNSER study wasn't published. Because you kind of get a number called 22 or 23, and they go back and, well, that's, not, that's just not significant. You got to get above 25 to have a reasonable alpha and a reasonable chance to get a statistically sam significant sample. So you keep plowing away till you get to that number, all right? And that's why I think it's difficult to get some of this data. Each participant 
It's a blind study. Each participant was made aware. We worked with several organizations, Dive Heart being one of them. You could do it or you could decline the study, but that didn't mean that you could, you could not dive. You know, it had nothing to do with do you want to dive or not. It was a question, do you want to participate in the study? They, they have to go through the, the standard PADI form, complete the medical questionnaire. Interestingly enough, Tina Marie, you know this. We lost a lot of divers because they couldn't afford to get a medical questionnaire answered. Or they couldn't travel to get a medical questionnaire answered. They were, they were yeah. veterans? Veterans. Yeah, but if, if you don't live to any, any uh, VA hospital, you can go to any hospital you want now. They have that program I'm just, I don't, shoot the, don't shoot the reporter here, all right? <laughs> I'm telling you that this is what they would say to us. They, couldn't, they could not get their medical certification. The doctors right? would not approve they, Well, they couldn't find a doctor that would do that or wouldn't, wouldn't approve it. And, you know, again, you have to think, a lot of these people are from farms, from the country, from, you know, and I'll tell a couple stories, but, I mean, they're not all city people here in Chicago, okay? And then the participants were chosen from a, from a sample. And as I said, some of the people that answered didn't have any, have any kind of injuries at all. So obviously they're not part of the sample size, all right? Some of the participants had spinal cord injuries. Some of the participants had, were amputees. So you have, you know, since we didn't know who's going to answer the question, we just, we had to take that out of the data. That's so we obviously have a larger population than what our sample size came up with. The veteran completed the questionnaire pre-dive, and then just as soon as possible as he came out of the water or she came out of the water, they completed it post-dive, okay? So it was, it, what we had then is a comparison, control group, okay? It's called pair uh, T-test, pair sample T-test, a before and after. They weren't required to, rec to complete this, and some, you know, completed the first, half and didn't complete the second half or whatever else or some completed the second half we never could find the first half all right so all that goes into the data it's collected in multiple states and multiple dive locations so it, it you know it, it makes it nice to know that it just didn't all come out of Chicago or it just didn't all come out of someplace else all right now here's the rub pending publication Dr. Goodman can tell you how much fun it is to try to get these things published. Yes? Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Our goal is to have it done for next year, all right? But basically, you know, we completed an outreach to so many people, we completed dives in several locations, okay? Here, Cozumel, okay, San Diego, Miami, all right? And we ended up with a valid number of divers. And that's the key, we ended up with a valid sample size. Huh? It was above 25. <laughs> huh? Yeah, well, again, I'm under strict orders or I won't be able to stay at home, okay? So uh, this is, I don't know if you can see this, but can you see hearts on here? Okay, you know where this is? It's Miami, okay? This is Miami. This is one of the sites that, you know, that participated. So this is a Discover dive. Doesn't look like they're in a lot of deep water to me. What do you think? You know, they're in what, four or five feet of water? Okay. And so part of the research was on the Discover dive. You know, you had talked some about hyperbaric uh, therapy. If you want to start a fist fight, we learned, talk about hyperbaric therapy therapy works or doesn't work, okay, because you'll get a lot of arguments over that. And one of the thesis was, well, you know, that's the benefit of scuba diving is that it was the hyperbaric therapy, all right? Of course, here's the longitudinal dive, which is what people had completed about, uh, what, Jim, at least six or eight dives in order to get to, to, to certification, right? So it ended up in the ocean. The other thing that was diverse about this is that the, you know, the military comprises a pretty diverse set of people, both in terms of eth ethnicity and in terms of uh, religion, in terms of uh, male, female, etc. It's interesting because, again, there were, there were 
females that participated in this study, whereas I think if we'd have done this 10 or 15 years ago, there would have been none, all right? Um, one of the things that we learned is that the overall age of these veterans are much younger than prior wars in general. These are kids that came out of school, okay, went into the service. And a much higher percentage of reservists. And the other thing that we learned is that if you're in an army group, you get called up and you all go here. If you're a reserve, they say, well, you go there, you go there, you go there. So you don't have your comrades. You kind of lose some of that cohesiveness. Like I say, more women serving in a variety of, uh, of capacities. The disabilities, again, were mostly, a lot of them were IEDs. There was about 5,000 killed in those um, three wars, which is a low number when you think about it, all right, compared to most combat actions, because they were well taken care of from a protection standpoint. But you know, I look at you, Dr. Goodman, I don't know if you've had a head injury or not. You look okay to me, you know? That's the problem, all right? I don't know whether you got your head banged around in a, in a, in a Humvee or what. So, but the, what we had to try to do is say, how does diversity play any difference? And it doesn't. Here's the demographics. Look, look at the age group. Okay, now this is, they're between 35 and 45, and, or 36 and 45, and they're, um, we're what, about eight or nine years past the war, okay? So they're all young men, women. Look at the hump in this bubble. Look at the service branch, mainly the Army, okay? Half the Marines, some of the Navy, National Guard. So again, across broad sections of the service. Here's the one thing I can say. Scuba diving demonstrated positive statistical significant results. Can you attest to what that means? So statistical significance, sure. I mean, yeah. Yes. So statistical significance is a way of numerically comparing two or multiple groups. Uh, you could potentially compare, it sounds like in this study, within a group, saying a before and after. Uh, there is a whole host of different types of statistical testing that can be done depending on the measures that you're using, the study design. Generally speaking, though, when you use a certain, certain statistical test, there's a certain number of factors that are generally recognized that are met before you use that certain statistical test. And a result from that, statistical significance, there's a, oftentimes a specific number, what they'll often say is a P less than 0 0.05. Uh, you can meet a statistical significance depending on the type of test that you're doing. Uh, but when you state that you utilize a statistical test and you have a result from that, it can apply to, it, it has a broader meaning. Is that, that outside people can understand, yes, I understand what this test is and what the result of the test means and whether it's significant or not. And it had a Cohen's efficient of 0.95, okay? Which is hugely significant, okay? Anything above about 0.6 gets them excited, 0.95. So that's why we're so excited about what hopefully we can get published, Jim, all right? But there is a measured change in quality of life for these vets, before and after. And in addition, there were six major categories in, in this questionnaire and um, 37 sub questions. But in addition to the whole quality of life, several of the subcategories also demonstrated positive significance. So this is important. And the point of it is, this research supports such anecdotal comments. I'm in a different world. We talk about this, all right? I can clear my head. My pain is less. I don't need drugs to feel good anymore. And this one I love. I was so excited when I finished, 
I went home and slept nine hours. Sorry. I know this, I, this guy called me. It's the first good night's sleep I've had in six years. Think about that. He's since called me. He's gone back to school. He's quit smoking. He's got certified. I'll tell you, if you don't know who it is, I'll tell you who it is. All right. <clears throat> I can tell you a bunch of stories like this. After people have been in the water, okay, and come out. Again, the article is ready. We're just trying to get it published, all right? And it's a long haul to get it through the publishers, all right? Here's the point. PTSD costs a lot of money. A lot of these vets can't afford it. They don't go to the, they don't go to the VA. We're going to pick up the tab, you and me, all right? Probably 50 grand over a course of their life. And the more important thing, it could be significant through the course of this whole period. Just do the math, okay? Just do the math. Half a million veterans. Now, by the way, you can put that in civilian population too. People have car accidents, things like this, but just keep it inside the veteran population. It's very significant. One of the things that's sad about this, these veterans never get a really good job, you know, a lot of them, right? They're home, okay? They're a burden to society, they're a burden to their family, okay? These were people that, that could be productive in society and now sit at home. Tina Marie can tell you stories, I can tell you stories of people that have not been out of their house for nine months. PTSD. I see you shaking your head, yes, you know those stories, right? Not been out of their house for nine months. I can tell you about a couple of them haven't been out of their room. How do the veterans now? Hmm? They don't even tell them they, they're a veteran. When no. they go get a job, they say, no, I'm not a veteran. No. Because they don't want to hire them because they think something's wrong with them. Yeah. The biggest thing is, if you start to think about it, if, if you have somebody like this, the impact on the families, okay, on the loved ones, everybody that has to take care of that particular individual. So the burden is just larger. It's not. It's one thing for me to break my arm and say, you know, it hurts and I can't use it as well as I used to. But this is a much bigger, broader <clears throat> problem that needs to be solved. And as I said, this is much bigger because they could have had many, many years of productive work in life in years ahead. It's a complex treatment, okay? This is one, okay? What comes out of it is a strong sense of self-efficacy. Did I say that word right? Yeah, I'm not the psychologist, all right? And it predicts a higher quality of life than they would have had if they hadn't started scuba diving. This was the signature wound. Hopefully this study will provide the incentive and the basis, okay, for much larger studies, okay, with bigger sample sizes to prove, all right, that in fact this form of therapy does have a statistical positive psychological impact on quality of life for those veterans that suffer TBIs and PTSD. I'm sorry I can't share the data with you because it's pretty darn exciting, okay? I've kind of given Jim a little bit of a peek under the covers, okay? But I have to shoot him if he does anything. <clears throat> but Dr. Floyd is uh, excited to get this completed. Uh, we're, we're uh, and, and the way, the, he talks about peer-reviewed journals. We could publish this in the newspaper tomorrow. But the idea is to get it in a peer-reviewed journal and <coughs> and you want certain ones to be there first. So that's why we're going down the line. Maybe I'll talk to you a little bit afterward about what your experience is. So thank you very much for listening. I, if there are questions, I, I will try to answer them. I'm not sure I can, but uh, yes, sir. One thing that supports what you're talking about. Um, the past 10 years, I've been invited to take my autism outreach work to the National Hobo Convention. Most people think 
hobo homeless and not necessarily know what that is and when I was first invited to the hobo convention I found out that many of the hobo the homeless hobos who are rail riders were actually veterans who were forced to go on the rails because they could not find employment or reintegrate and at the hobo convention was actually a place where many of those veterans found camaraderie in fact a memorial service is done collectively for the hobos and even if Although not all the hobos are veterans, not everyone has served. Every year, the Legion Hall, in honor of the fact that many veterans were forced to become hobos, they do a 21-gun salute and play taps in honor of all the fallen hobos who did serve, even if the hobos that are being honored that year have not served. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> With the research that you're, that you're talking about there, with the with the cost of, um, of <coughs> providing scuba therapy, in, in a sense, using it from that point of view, uh, do you see the potential for uh, the investment of investing in scuba diving as a therapy for veterans? People are talking about veterans, so we're going to veterans. To, to organizations that uh, provide services where it would be <coughs> demonstrated that this particular modality can actually reduce some of the other costs available or, 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 or generated <coughs> medical costs, uh, psychological costs, environmental issues that are going on. If, if, if you have improved uh, a quality of life, and so, okay, maybe you'll look to go back to work. Maybe you'll be able to come off of some of your uh, 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 financial uh, dependency, so to speak. I mean, so what I'm saying is, can you can you begin to think of a correlation between the, the cost of the therapy being uh, financially beneficial to those agencies or organizations that are supposedly having to take care of the veterans, so that would be an investment that they would be looking at as a let me uh, let me help you a little bit here, and Jim, you can verify this. But but a scuba locker, fully outfitted, is somewhere between a hundred and hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get about thirty suits, I think, give or take, right? Think think of just for the heck of it. Think of a trailer. Think of a of a fifty-two foot trailer, okay, with that in there. Think of fifteen locations around the country, okay. You cover 64% of the population. Just add water and a pool, okay? You do this morning, noon, and night. You use the same suits over and over and over. So the cost per veteran, it's basically their gas money, I mean, at the end of the day, all right? And the instructor, I mean, all, there's, I'm not belittling all the instructor and the volunteer time, but <laughs> what from what we've seen and some of the numbers that we've put together, this is a is a low cost, low risk, pretty high reward program. All right. Obviously, the problem is pool time. Okay. But you know, when you think about it, if you got an equipment locker there, <laughs> get ten of them out of the water, put it back in there. What? Put another ten in. Right. You could do that morning, noon, and night. So it's a question, like I say, of getting it to a bigger scale, because I think we prove statistically that it works. And to Jesse and Brown, a cost benefit to it also. yes, we we supply. I mean, we had the program scuba diving program. We have the the, the we go to Brave Hearts, mm -hmm. which is the horseback riding. We have uh, the skiing and, and uh, rock climbing for our veterans to go to any time. You know, we have it like once a week, something going on. So this. Or anybody, any of the veterans can go. Well, it's, it's, um, <coughs> we didn't talk to, obviously because it was blind, we didn't talk to a lot of these veterans, but we did talk to some of them. And the response was always the same. I felt terrific, you know? I mean, it just, it was, it, it just was amazing. So I, it's uh, something that I can't thank you enough for to get us started, you and Tina Marie. All right, Jim introduced us to a couple of other organizations, and, and we've, uh, 
So we've kind of expanded it, and that's kind of how we finally got our sample size. Yes, ma'am. No. Started with the Discover dive, which would be the first dive, okay? This is a scuba outfit, okay? You know, and here's what you do. By the way, you've taken the, the data before. Put it all on, you come into the water, and these guys push you around, and you come back out, and you take it. <coughs> you take that same thing and do it before they go into the ocean or open water and do it again, and you can compare either that or the end, the longitudinal, from beginning to end. Statistically, it's significant either way. What did you have to do to get past the IOD? How long did that process take? <laughs> uh, I didn't have to do anything to get past the IRB, all right? However, my wife, it took her about eight months to get through the IRB. <coughs> the other problem that we found is that we could not get the, the Veterans Administration or anybody else, not because they didn't want to be cooperative, but they said you'd have to go through IRRIRB, which would be a two-year process. And she wanted to graduate. So, I mean, that's why we didn't take that path. All right. But it's... Is there anything you wish you would have done differently? Well, I wish I would have done it differently. No, not really. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the answer to which is it's a discovery process. You know, you start out with, well, does scuba work? So maybe just go down and get some people in the ocean and say, what do you think? All right. Well, they're all, when you think about it, they're already past that bridge. And it took, us, uh, took her a while to figure out it's that initial aha, you know? Oh, my God. Okay? That's... That's what, you know, when you started working your way through that, and that took a while to figure out, all right? So you're looking for what the... Uh, Just the name of the research. Right, the heading for the study. Were there any negatives in your research? In your um, I, can, I can tell you, tell you this much. The overwhelming majority uh, had a positive effect, okay? There were some that they demonstrated their quality of life went down since we couldn't talk to them. But we speculate <coughs> that they may have thought that this would free them and it didn't. I mean, I, I don't, I can't, Jim, you probably can answer that kind of question better than I can. You know, but the overwhelming portion of these people as near as we can tell, from a data standpoint, we're pretty significant. All right. Yes, ma'am. Because you have outliers that people that couldn't complete the skill uh, or um, complete their dive have negative effects. None in the Discover dive. There were. Don't hold. Uh, don't hold me. This two. I think one or two that did not complete the longitudinal experience. Okay. I don't know why. All right. I can't answer. I can't answer that question, because again, <coughs> we gathered the data from the providers. All right. So, it's, so it, you know, it's kind of a, a blind study as far as we're concerned. All we can do is look at the numbers. Okay. Can you talk about a little bit about your inclusion and exclusion criteria? Uh, had to be a veteran. Okay. The questionnaire would, uh, the, the demographic questionnaire said, have you suffered a TBI or PTSD? <coughs> what percent service connected are you? If they filled it out and did the dive, but they weren't TBI or PTSD, they were excluded. So as I said, there were, I don't remember. S several, the had SCI, spinal cord injuries, okay? Fill out the data, and when you ran the data through and compared it to everything, it's like same result. So okay. No, no, no. As long as they had TBI and or a PTSD and or both, that was the inclusionary factor. All right, but 
you know, some, uh, we had people that were amputees. I mean, it's kind of like if you took the, the data in total, it's just as good, okay? But the focus on the IRB was, was there something peculiar to PTSD and TBIs? So, I mean, that was the inclusionary focus, all right? And, and so, I mean, obviously our, sample, our, our gathering of data was much larger than our sample size, okay, which is one of the things why I understand the UNSER study, why they, they had 13, and I don't, I'm not a statistical math major, but that doesn't get you much in terms of, it gets you speculation, right, in terms of <coughs> what an alpha should be. So you got to get kind of above 25. Yes, sir. We, we, they, had to, they had to go through the PADI certification, is that what it is? PADI or SPI? Yeah. Okay. I mean, th th they had to get through Tina Marie, if you know what I mean. Yes. Um, let me help the answer to that. So one of the things that Dive Heart's doing, because we have run into this issue over and over again with people want to be participants, is get, just get in the pool. Much, not much more than that, or possibly lead to certification in an ocean. Um, we actually have um, a team right now that's working on updating a medical questionnaire that would be more specific yeah. to people that we work with, people with disabilities, cognitive and physical, and also write something to assist their doctor in helping evaluate if this person can work with us. So we're looking at doing that because I think that will make it much easier for people to be able to participate in this activity. Somebody can bring in a pamphlet or something to their doctor. Right. Here's an assessment. And and when we can't do that, when we can't uh, convince a doctor, we then bring in people like Dan or our uh, representatives from Duke Medical uh, University and, and try and get them to then explain doctor to doctor because we're not doctors. Um, well, and we try to get them to explain to one another and have that conversation. So it's, um, it's an interesting predicament sometimes. But yes, it is. Uh, in order to I'm sorry. move along, I think All we're right. going to have to, I, I want to have you up here forever. But, no, uh, <laughs> we've got, we've I'm got over my skis people. now, yeah. <laughs> Just to quickly, Gina, is that up and running yet? Or it's not. It's actually it? currently in process. So we're hoping, I'm, you know, let, I'll give myself a little lead time. But by the end of this year, we'll hopefully have that in, in our program. So How did you advertise for your study? How did you put it out there? Or uh, did Jim do the lab work? Jim helped. We, we you know, it, word of mouth. Uh, uh, would, uh, she didn't post it any place. I mean, you know, we tried to go through the VAs, met with the not invented IRB here, okay. Um, I mean, part of it, honestly, was, it'd be one thing if you were doing research for, for life, okay, then maybe you would have gone, taken the time to go through the VA and things like this, but, you know, she's, she has spent the last seven years uh, getting her master's and her, and her clinical psychology. And so, you know, you reach a point where you want to write your thesis and go on, all right. The so, other big thing, issue was I think she needed to be part of an ongoing program. So you yeah. couldn't create the program to then further further the research you wanted. She wanted to meet people who were currently going to be a part of a program no matter right. what, and then ask them, would you like to participate versus, you know, having them want to participate first. So they had a funny business around that. But see, it was, sure it, because then we could be accused of cooking the data, right, yeah, okay. So it's like, here is the here's the questionnaire, and we get back, 
AB793, you know, for a, for a code, okay? I don't know what that meant, but that was that particular person's code. So they could answer it before and, you know, get the same question there afterward, okay? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Our final presenter today is David Lenny. He's a graduate.